2022 has been a very challenging year for investors and for stock portfolios and stock and bond portfolios. It has, uh, I think, every style of investing has had its challenges. It's the market has gone down and then it has tried to go back up and that doesn't work. So it just collapses and goes on down further and further. So there've been two or three attempts for it to, uh, where it's tried to go back up and it just, it keeps failing. So it's, it's been challenging for almost everybody. Hi, I'm Ben Repond. Welcome to my YouTube broadcast. Today is December 29, 2022. I'm going to play a piece from uh, where Melissa Lee at CNBC is interviewing Chris Verone. And he talks about Apple and that Apple it has been an interesting indicator for the market and where he sees Apple going, particularly as he looks back at previous uh, bear markets and the and Apple is a leader. So uh, how has that how is that like he believes other leaders in other market conditions and what he thinks the future of Apple is and the future at least the short term future of the stock market. So here's uh, Chris Barone. We start off with the big growth trade conundrum. All the pieces that should be supporting the sector seem to be falling into place lately. First, investor rates, interest rates have been dropping sharply. The yield on 10-year Treasury is down 75 basis points from its October high. Traditionally, lower rates are good for growth stocks. Then there's a dollar also down, almost 9%, in fact, since September. And inflation, signs emerging that pricing pressures are abating. The consumer price index lower five months in a row now. All of that should give a boost to the growth trade, but not this time. The ARK Innovation ETF, for example, losing two-thirds of its value already this year and hitting an all-time low today. And it's not just the highly speculative names that are struggling. Apple dropping more than a percent and a half today and is now just 2% from June lows. One of our traders tonight has a stark warning about just how much lower this one-time tech stalwart could go. Let's go to Chris Verone and his charts. Chris, what are you looking at? Hey, Melissa, yeah, I think it's such a great lead because when we think about what's happened over the last week, everything has been so bullish for growth stocks, but they can't respond to it. Over the last two months, you have rates down, you have dollar down, you have softer inflation, but the big weights, especially Apple, unable to respond here. And I think what's really notable the street still hasn't changed its opinion of the stock yet. There's 45 analysts who cover Apple. The stock's down 30 or 40 percent from the highs. You still have 37 of 45 analysts and a price target of $173. Everyone is still a buy on the name. I think you have to see more pessimism come into the name before it's buyable. We think that happens lower. And you know, when you consider the longer term picture here of what the chart uh, is actually telling us. You know, here's the last two years. I mean, this looks like one big rolling top formation to us. I thought breaking below that 135 level, which has been support really all year, is a very important development today, closing 132 spot 37. And, you know, when you take a little bit of a longer step back, look at the last four or five years here uh, when it comes to the Apple name. Think 12, 1231.19 before COVID. The stock was $75. So many of these pe big tech names have simply returned to where they were pre-COVID. That's 75 to 100 for Apple. And you know, if we take a step back and just look bigger picture, these names, these big tech names, these big growth weights are still too big. This is the combined weight of the six largest issues on 123121 uh, 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 at the start uh, of this year. They're still 25% of the S&P. I think ultimately this goes lower. These bear markets don't end until the best names get hit. That's Apple for us. I like 100. Next, I want to play a piece from uh, Becky Quick from CNBC. She's interviewing uh, JJ Kinahan and from uh, IG North America. Uh, he, not unlike what you just heard, he sees a, the market the equity market going down from here. And that, that's his view of 2023. And he sort of says, basically, there's no good choices out there. You know, if you look at bonds or you look at stocks or, you know, commodities, you know, they're not very good choices anywhere. And he makes the case for sitting in cash for right now. And that's where we are in our managed portfolio. 
sitting in cash, waiting for an opportunity, waiting for some kind of confirmation that the market is actually going up and hopefully will have uh, go up in a sustained way, but it's not now. So here is um, JJ Kinahan and Becky Quick. JJ, let's talk about this. What, what Tepper was laying out yesterday was pretty serious. This idea that he doesn't really see anywhere to go. He's gonna be short on credit, short, short on uh, treasuries and short on equities too. And that's a pretty unusual position. Not all re retail investors wanna go short. So if that's the case, if you don't wanna go short, you're worried about what next year is bringing, where do you go? Yeah, and you know, he says he's leaning short. Well, most retail traders have to lean long, Becky, just if you look at their longer term investments and the IRAs, et cetera. So what's really been interesting to me is kind of watching and over the last few months, what's happened uh, and you know what we saw, if I go year over year, last year we still saw some individual names being purchased, et cetera. What we're seeing right now is the uh, ETFs that are based on indices, so primarily uh, spiders and QQQs and index, uh, both options and underlyings themselves, have gone from 25% of our trading a year ago to almost 40% right now. And so it's not only the overall market that's confusing, but the individual stocks have also been a place that's really been difficult for uh, people to be. And there's no one name that leaps out. So you can see a pattern. You know, you see the interview with J.J. Kinahan, and then you see the one with uh, Chris Verone. Uh, last week, a couple of weeks ago, I played one from Mike Wilson from um, Morgan Stanley. All of them are saying about the same thing. Uh, Mike Wilson gave more color to it. He said he saw, because he was pinned down for a specific answer, he saw that equities during the first or second quarter, probably second quarter, are going to uh, drop quite a bit. And, um, and then the way I read his numbers is probably the second half of the year will be some kind of a recovery, maybe even some kind of a, a rally. So, um, but all of them are saying somewhat the same thing. Um, Sarah Eisen from CNBC interviews Howard Marks, and he looks back over his career, which he says is 53 years, and he saw in that 53-year period three sea changes, meaning very big macro changes in the way the market behaves. And not the direction, the direction being up or down, but what's causing, what's behind that, that uh, is uh, from a macro view is changing. And so um, here's this interview with Sarah Eisen. Howard, welcome. Fre fresh Thank off you. that memo everyone's talking about. Thank you, Sarah. It's nice to be here. It's good to have you and, and happy holidays. So let's start with the sea change. That, that was the big headline from your report. It's how you, you kicked off your memo. You said 53 years in your investing career, there have been three sea changes and we are in one of them. What does that mean? Well, a sea change is a major transformation of the environment, a complete change in attitudes, et cetera. And I suspect that we, that we may be at the beginning of one. Uh, the first one was the, uh, the fall of interest rates uh, from 20 to zero between 80 and, uh, 1980 and 2020, which had uh, sure. very, very positive effects. The second was the opening of investors' minds to what we call risk return analysis. And before the 70s, the job of the investor was to avoid risk. Uh, after the 70s, it was to intelligently take risk. And that was a big change. And I think that we may be uh, on the doorstep of, of the third. So what, what is the sea change? Well, you know, since- That's the, happening. Since the Fed, central banks around the world and the treasury uh, took uh, strong action to solve the global financial crisis uh, in 08, 09, uh, we have been living in a highly stimulated, very positive, uh, easy money environment uh, for uh, roughly uh, 14 years. And uh, I think that, you know, a lot of people began to invest or came into the business in those 14 years. Not too many have a perspective on the period before the global financial crisis. And, and, and uh, uh, they may think that the last 14 years was normalcy. I don't think so. I think it was the best imaginable period for borrowers and for asset owners. Uh, and I don't think that it's uh, necessarily gonna continue. So do you, do you characterize the past 14 years post, 
financial crisis as a bubble, and now that now that's popping, we return to some sort of normality or even a crash? Well, a bubble, uh, most people take a bubble to mean irrational appreciation. And uh, the, the asset appreciation in that period was not uh, terribly positive. It wasn't an unusual 14-year uh, period in terms of uh, asset returns, et cetera. And it, it wasn't the, the result of uh, uh, unrealistically optimistic thinking. So I, bubble, I think, has a specific use. But it was a, it was a hyped, uh, unusually positive uh, period of when everything was easy. Uh, for certain classes of, uh, of people, uh, as I said before, borrowers and asset owners in particular. Uh, and right. it isn't normalcy, and it's not, I don't think, going to be the norm going forward. And finally, uh, the final piece I want to play for you is uh, Becky Quick again, interviewing David Wessel from the Brookings Institution. And he's talking about inflation. Inflation's currently, the CPI is currently at about 7.3%. Uh, and the Fed has stated, uh, Chairman Powell has stated, he wants to see that inflation is down around 2%. So 7% plus down to 2%. And interest rates have already risen quite a bit. And he says it's going, the Fed has a ways to go, and they even admit that, and it's going to take time. He refers to the fact that it may take a couple of years of increases. Investors, many investors, are looking for what they call a pivot, when they're going to stop raising interest rates and turn around and start cutting interest rates, or at least pause interest rates. And based on David Wessel's view, and really when you think about it, how far inflation is, if it's at 7% plus, the CP way the CPI is reported, all the way down to 2% or anything close to that, that is going to require a lot of rate increases. And um, so we'll uh, see where that goes. But it's an interesting interview with David Wessel. For more on the latest inflation numbers uh, and to get his views on the Fed, we want to bring in David Wessel. He is the director of Brookings Institution's Hutchins Center on Fiscal and Monetary Policy. And David, what do you think? We, we keep thinking and keep hoping that we have seen the, the peaks of inflation, but how long do you think it lasts? How high do you think it'll be before we get back to the Fed's target of 2%? I think the inflation is moving in the right direction. <clears throat> One of the good things about today's number is that it's not surprising, and we've had so many surprises on the inflation front. Um, this is consistent with the forecast that the Fed put out in its last statement of economic projections for where they think PCE inflation will be. But as you point out, we're still a long way from 2%, and I don't think the Fed will be satisfied that the inflation rate is coming down fast enough. And Jay Powell in particular keeps harping on wage costs. He thinks wages are rising too fast to be consistent with his 2% inflation target. So I expect they'll keep raising rates. I think it'll be a couple of years before we get inflation down to 2%. And who knows, the Fed may change the target before we get there. Next, I want to show a chart. This is a 150-year um, chart going back to 1870, and it's the um, S&P um, 500 composite index uh, adjusted for inflation on a logarithmic chart. So it's very realistic when you um, put it logarithmically and then you put it on a uh, inflation adjusted. You can see the periods, the bull markets marked by blue, and they're very jagged, but in generally speaking, they go up. And then you can see the bear markets marked in red. So we have been in a bull market for the last 14 years. However, the, you can see at the end of the chart to the upper right, you can see where it's come down. So if the... Uh, S&P 500 has come down, let's say, 20%. I think it was down about 22, 23 at one point, and then it fell back into the teens, and today it's probably around 20. So down about 20%, but you can see that little tick down, how little that is. But that represents, on an inflation-adjusted basis, logarithmic chart, that represents what we experienced in 2022. That's all of 2022 measured through the end of November. 
So when you look at the um, trend line that goes through the data, you can see, uh, the, let's call that the mean, you can see how far that is still above the mean. So when people talk about uh, the S&P having further to fall, you know, they've talked about numbers that uh, are uh, S&P from 3,000 to 3,300, and I'll translate that. That means another 15% plus further to fall from here to get down to a point where it is kind of exhausted. But that still puts us on this chart historically when you look at it, you look at the trend line, still above the trend line. So uh, if you look at this over a period of time, um, I, I've played a piece from Russell Napier in the past who financial historian, and he refers to this bear market as being, um, or, or you know, the, the uh, rise of interest rates, the fall of bonds, et cetera being a 10 to 15 year period of time, we tend to think of it as, oh, it's right now. It's what's happening this week or this month uh, or even this year. But he put a, a, a longer view on it, of really say, and when you look at this, you can see that these bear markets tend to go down. The last one went down for, was about a bear market for about nine years. The Great Depression was about 20 years and the other two were around 15%, 15 years. So the, it's, a, um, it's probably just a longer view. What that means though, is during the period of, of that period of time, the market would go down, not straight down, but down and look at those red periods, they're all bear markets. All of that period, those periods of time, the market is trying to go back up and then it fails. It tries to go back up and then it fails. Why is that? In my opinion, what we have right now is we have a lot of excess in the system, a lot of excess. You come down to valuation. Where is the valuation of the equities in any of the indexes or individually? You know, for that matter, even you go back to Apple. Uh, you look at those, there is excess money. There's excess value in the system to really hit, get to a bottom where all of these bear markets are, to get there, it means that you've got to wash out that excess in valuations out of the system. This is a um, uh, indicator for growth, and it comes from the Economic Cycle Research Institute. And you can see, this is a 22 year period, you can see these, the, periods where it goes below the zero line. And these are periods of contraction. And so you can see we've had several of them in the last 20 years, but look at where we are today. Look at the far right of that chart. You can see already from a, a growth indicator standpoint, we are in a period of contraction. Not yet at the 2020, March 2020 level or at the 2008 level, but it's already on its way down quite a bit. There are, this is a chart that does a composite view of four methods of valuation, valuing the stock market. Now this is not the stock market. These are value, it's a chart showing valuations different from, from the previous chart. And the, I put a, a black arrow there to show where the mean is. And so you can see from a valuation standpoint how far we still are above the mean and look at the periods of time where it go in bear markets where it goes below the mean. And so when I talk about excess value in the system that that's got to get washed out for us to really truly hit a bottom uh, that's what I'm talking about. So the, um, yeah, a, a lot of excess uh, value that, or price prices, uh, and that valuation has got to come down. This composite of four, uh, four different ways of measuring uh, valuation is a, um, it's a good indicator. 
This uh, is still at 87% above the mean. Where we are today, 87%. That doesn't mean it has to drop 87% to get there because valuations can happen. They can change in a way that's different from the market. So it doesn't mean a market drop of 87, but from a valuation standpoint, um, I call it a lot of fluff still in the system. The um, shadowstats.com does a, um, on their website, uh, has uh, an, a, the correct, the, what they believe is a correct view of inflation. And what they're doing is adding, the, the government takes out a lot of things in uh, what, what they report in inflation to get to what we have today, a CPI number of 7.3%. Uh, they disclose some of those on their website, and some of them they're kind of vague about, uh, particularly the, the substitution method where they substitute from one year to another, one item for another in order to um, get numbers lower. And what they report is represented by the red line, and what um, Shadow Stats does is put back in all of the things that they take out to give more of a true view of what inflation really is. So when everything is added back in, you can see that the real rate of inflation is probably about 15%. Now, I don't have to tell you that because you do, <laughs> you buy things and do, you do your own shopping and pay your bills, you know that it's not 7%. Um, I, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but I, I saw this article, a couple of articles, and, and I thought it was very interesting. I don't know if you saw this or not, but in China, they are reporting, this it was in a 20-day period of time, this was a leaked report that came out of the National Health uh, Department of uh, Chinese government, and I guess they didn't want it out there, but it got out that it's reported that uh, 248 million people are infected with COVID in a 20-day period of time. Wow. Their population is about uh, 1.4 billion. So my calculation was, I believe, 17% uh, of that population is infected in a 20-day period of time. Think about that. What are the implications of this for the, for the world? Because we are the um, consumer engine of the world, but China is probably the production engine of the world. So those two have to be in sync for us to um, work effectively. And that includes shipping and um, you know, production, consumption, everything. And when things break down like this, uh, in my opinion, of course, you know, we would all feel for those people who are infected with COVID, but from an economic standpoint also, it's a, um, uh, is not probably not a good indicator. It's not a good um, characteristic for a growth economy. And then the second article I saw was that there are 5,000 deaths per day in China from COVID, 5,000 a day. Now I know they have 1.4 billion people, but that's still 5,000 people. And that came out of Reuters actually. So uh, there are challenges. We obviously have our own challenges. Europe has incredible challenges, but, uh, the, uh, but China has theirs as well. The flow of funds report uh, came out on the 21st and that reports data through the 14th, except money market uh, is actually based on the 21st. So that showed a, a, an outflow of funds from equity funds of 30 billion and an outflow of bond funds of 10 billion. And l listen to this, an outflow of money market funds of 28 billion. So maybe that's going into the reverse repo market. So I don't know. It, but just money is going out of the market. I'm going to show you a picture. These are two of my children, Spencer and Elise. 
this picture was taken in my son David's home at Thanksgiving. And the, um, so I want to focus on Elise. This is just the most recent picture I had, so it gets to include Spencer. The um, reason I show this is I want to do a shout out to Elise, congratulating her for getting a 3.5 this semester in her master's program at Georgia Tech in data science. I was proud of her for even getting admitted to Georgia Tech. I thought that was amazing because they're a top 10 school in graduate studies in data science. Uh, but she did get in and um, now she has a 3.5 GPA with one semester left. So <laughs> anyway, and she's doing this while she's uh, holding down a full time job. So uh, congratulations to Elise for great work and hang in there for one more semester. If you have questions or comments, leave them in the comments section below and I will try to answer them. And I hope you have a very good and happy New Year.